What's up guys, my name is Josh and welcome to another review. Uh, I gotta apologize for my voice. It's a little hoarse right now, I'm still getting over whatever it is I had. All right, so the Aria. This is not a perfect headphone. Um, it has a lot of flaws, it has a lot of things that are not up to par with other uh, headphones in its price range because this is coming in at about $1,600, which is really quite pricey. The interesting part about this uh, headphone is that from pretty much the first day I heard it, uh, which was actually a couple months back ago now, I knew it was gonna be you know, up for the number one contender spot, definitely top five, maybe even top three. And to review, I really wanted to make sure that I had a good understanding of what this review was all about. And I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth in this review than I normally would. So I wanna send a huge thank you to Israel for uh, loaning this to me for review. Uh, Israel is a patron of mine. If you do wanna support me on Patreon to get early access to videos like this one, there's a link in the description down below. Now, a similar thing that I had to say about the HU-1000 V2 was that it's kind of hard to complain about the build of these devices because they're really pretty comfortable. And, you know, if they're lightweight and, uh, you know, they're, they're comfortable when you're using them, it's kind of hard to talk about quality. Although it is also fair to say that at a $1,600 price tag, you would expect something of fairly high quality. But even something like the lower end, you know, a fraction of the price Sundara actually has a better build quality than the Aria does. It uses metal on the actual ear cups and on the ear brackets, and this is kind of plastic almost all the way around except for the metal headband. Although uh, this bar mechanism, like all headphones with this kind of bar mechanism up top looks a little silly when you're wearing it, it's not what I would consider to be low profile. And you're really gonna see people start to complain about build when you really measure this in comparison to other headphones. For example, the Odyssey LCD 2C or the Alex, has, you know, it's literally half the price of this headphone and it has build quality that is astonishing comparatively to this. But there are a couple things that make the Aria really, really comfortable and, you know, a joy for me personally to wear. One is going to be the ear-shaped cups and the size of those cups. And for my head, they fit really well. The headphone strap is fairly comfortable and it's pretty balanced in weight and doesn't feel kind of all, uh, you know, kind of topsy-turvy or like your head is a hammer, like you kind of feel like with the LCD series. Now on the bottom, it has a dual 3.5 millimeter connector and I've been testing with a Periapt balanced cable. Shout out to Periapt for providing that cable a while ago. Now regarding some of the specs of this headphone, it's a 35 ohm headphone and it has a sound pressure level of 90 decibels per milliwatt. So you do need a little bit of power to drive it. It's certainly not a massively efficient driver. Okay, so both the HE-1000 and the Aria have something that I find to be extraordinarily pleasing about the sound quality. Neither are technically the best. Um, you know, if you were to measure, you know, treble, mid-range, bass response, um, and like the cleanliness and the clarity of everything, there are headphones in certain categories that do it better, but this headphone, as well as the HE-1000, but this is coming in at uh, still very pricey, but a fraction of the cost, which is why this is getting that the best so far spot, is because it's the conglomeration of the features that add up to kind of an aggregate device. The concoction that those features make is, for me, just exceptional and beyond most of what I've heard before. And we'll talk a little bit about what makes the best about it um, near the end of this video. But for now, let's go ahead and jump into trouble response here. Oh, and I'm sorry, right before I get into that, there are a few headphones that have the same structure in similar driver sizes, and I'm not sure where exactly what's related to what. Um, some people say the Ananda is like a sister of the HE-1000. Some people say this is the sister of the HE-1000, whatever. Um, I've only heard the HE-1000 and the Aria. I haven't heard the Ananda, I haven't heard of the Edition X and the Edition XX. I look forward to those in the future, but for now, I can't speak on them. So Treble. Uh, treble on here is actually a bit of an odd duck. And the reason why I say that is because both, uh, again, the HE-1000 and this, which to my memory, calculate the flaws in memory heavily here, please, because it has been a while. Both of those headphones, including the Aria, has an amazing ability to deliver an extraordinary amount of detail to your ear, and it does it without feeling like you're being force-fed uh, details and crispiness. And that contrasts what the Sundara here does, because the Sundara is also a very detailed headphone, but 
you always feel like you're listening to a headphone that you know, is trying its best to be detailed. It seems a little bit more forced on here. I don't necessarily think I believe in, um, in people saying falsifying detail. I don't think that's actually possible to, you know, whatever signal is being fed into that headphone, it's either gonna display it or it's not. It's not gonna make up extra detail or extra nuance in a place where it uh, wasn't before. But depending on the frequency response of both and the speed of the drivers and all those factors, uh, you can have a more clinical feeling sound, and then you can actually have, you know, uh, less uh, forced sound, but just as, in my opinion, clinical, if you are willing to kind of search for it and hunt for it. Quick comparison for the treble against the Sundara. I would say that there's more immediate surface level detail on the Sundara, but it's harder to find the kind of, you know, the underlying detail, the details in the background, the details in the room. Uh, for the treble response, whereas the Aria has less surface level detail, but a whole lot more of that underlying detail. And honestly, I think some people are gonna like that more forced, crispy nature of the Sundara, and some people are going to, like me, like and appreciate the more you know laid back uh, approach of the Aria. Okay, mid-range. What makes this headphone part of the best for me is some of the unique characteristics that tend to pop up starting with the mid-range. And one of those unique characteristics is uh, there's actually, and I'm not sure if it's due to the size of the driver or the lightweight nature of the headphone or both or some other factor, but this headphone, even with mid-range, it vibrates a little bit. And so you get this kind of extra movement from the driver uh, or from the headphone on your kind of skull and you kind of feel that uh, similar to what like a subwoofer does for like a speaker system as it kind of makes the sound a little bit more three-dimensional and it kind of it kind of plays into that illusion of a real performance and this headphone kind of does that on your skull and so when you get these mid-range notes especially things like drums or very fast quick and harsh impact notes um, those things actually have a visceral feel to them and because of that visceral feel, um, it's able to kind of add this extra dimension to the sound that uh, not a lot of other headphones have. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with the actual sonic characteristics, but it does have to do with the listening experience. So mid-range on here for instrumental mid-range is just, it's kind of almost next level because of that. Now, if we're going to be talking about the sound quality itself and not calculating the experience into the into uh, the equation here. The actual sound quality of the mid-range is also very, very good. And, and one of the characteristics of the mid-range here is that it's kind of a transparent wall of sound. And what I mean by that is the bass is not uh, in your face. The treble is not in your face. Both are kind of laid back, kind of more into almost a tiered and layered sound stage. And so bass, while it's a lot, and treble, while it is, you know, it's plenty, uh, it's not approaching kind of in a direct manner. Uh, similar to how you would kind of hear from like a 6XX, but the mid-range is similar to a 6XX. It's a lot closer. It's a lot more forward. But unlike a 6XX, which is kind of like a ball kind of in the center of your head, this is more of like a, you know, a, a, a transparent plane or field of sound. And you can see everything behind that uh, that that vocalist or that that uh, piano, whatever happens to be playing in that mid range or displaying in that mid range, you can kind of hear all the notes and all the sounds behind it. It's uh, it's really quite good and it's very unique to this uh, uh, headphone. The HE1000 gave me the same vibes and I haven't heard it on just about any other headphone. Um, I've heard very transparent sound on headphones. I'm not talking about the transparency of being able to see amplifiers, not talking like that. I'm talking more like if you were to visualize the sound quality, uh, the mid-range is almost, it's it's thick, it's robust, but and it's not thin or shallow, but it does feel transparent and it seems like you can almost hear the music behind the mid-range rather than the mid-range being like, you know, a, a singer who's blocking what might be going on behind them. Now vocal mid-range is particularly good. Uh, vocal timbre, to my ear, and as far as I can tell, it sounds just about as natural as I've heard. So singers who have kind of a higher pitched voice like uh, Sam Smith's Not In That Way song, or Diana Krall's, uh, that's K-R-A-L-L, -L, 
Popsicle Toes. That's actually a tile uh, from Inner Fidelity. He recommended that in one of his videos. Great song, by the way. Uh, Sinead O'Connor's The Foggy Dew. All of those singers have their just distinctly different characteristics and nuances to their vocals. And even though they're somewhat similar, if you put them all in a, in a single song and displayed it through this headphone, you could pick them out like you know, lines on a chalkboard. It's black and white. It's not even close to coming into the same timbre characteristics. Now, I'm not gonna say that this headphone has no timbre characteristics to it, but I will say that, you know, when it comes to, to taking a vocal performance or a musical note and making it sound like the headphones, like for example, the HD 800, you know, when I'm listening to that headphone, it always sounds like I'm listening to that headphone. Whereas the Aria kind of feels like I'm listening to whatever the music wants it to do. If the music wants it to be thin and dry, it sounds thin and dry. If it wants it to be lush and rich and deep and soulful, it's lush and rich and deep and soulful. And the same timbre characteristics can also be said about instruments. I mean, you could, you could follow the lines and the story of each individual instrument, uh, you know, in, in an entire orchestra and you'd have no issues with this on this headphone. There is one downside um, and it's the S range. Now, I wanna be very clear here. It is not sibilance. Um, sibilance is kind of like this lack of resolution in the S frequencies. That's kind of like the best way I can, I can describe it. But when you get into a sibilant headphone, it's that, that lack of resolution plus a boost in that range. But it does really keep the resolution of the S frequencies and the S sound it keeps that really well. It's just a little bit boosted, and uh, the dynamics of this headphone allow it to be. Sometimes, if the if the recording has uh, been mixed, not to have a deesser in it or to reduce that range a little bit, like most music does, um, or some microphones are actually built to compensate for that, uh, just in their pickup patterns. If it doesn't have any of that, this headphone can occasionally get a little bit harsh, and that's just about the only real big complaint I have with the sound. Okay, now bass response. Uh, this one's kind of hard to place. When you put this on and you listen to it, it sounds thick and full, it really does. Uh, but it doesn't have the, that characteristic like thickness or kind of wall of bass that something like an LCD would have, like an LCX, which is another amazing headphone. Uh, what it more has is kind of a bass response that's sort of enveloping you from all around. And it, it actually seems to be coming from a little bit out in the sound staging department. And, you know, if you were to imagine, uh, there's, there's almost, there's kind of almost about three tiers to the sound staging capability. Uh, there's like the mid range, which is actually the closest. Then there's the bass response, which is kind of the mid, you know, kind of in the midfield sound. And then far field is kind of where the treble response comes from. It's, it's a very unique sound staging experience. Uh, but the bass response, it sounds huge. It's extremely dynamic. It's definitely present, um, but it's not as deep or hard hitting as, you know, like an LCX, an LC2C, uh, an M1060C open, a DT1990, and a Lex. It's not gonna quite hit as hard as that, but it is very, very warm in the bass response and very pleasant to listen to. It's really nice. Now, imaging and soundstage, and that's, this is where this headphone really separates from the others. Uh, similar to the HE1000s and the, um, the Stax headphones that I reviewed a while back, the L300 Limiteds, there's a verticality to the sound, okay? It doesn't sound like a point source. It sounds like this, like this vertical line of, you know, whatever that note happens to be. So if you're listening to Yoshi Hirokawa's uh, Timbers, which is T-I-M-B-R-E-S, I'm not sure if it's Timbers or Tambers, whatever. If you're listening to that song, all those very crisp and finite notes are still very crisp and finite. They're just really tall. And so that gives this headphone kind of a sense of scale and size that is really hard to achieve for other headphones. Other headphones can sound big, they can sound uh, deep, they can sound uh, grand, but not to this level. And I've tried a lot of headphones over the past year and a half, and very, very few compete with the size and scale that this is able to do. Now, size and scale, I'm specifically stating as size and scale. This isn't an extremely wide sound staging headphone. Uh, like when it comes to sound staging and total, total width, the HD 800s uh, take the cake there, 
by quite a large margin. Now these are actually more intimate in the close notes and like the vocal performance than the HD 800 is. Um, and that's part of why, why I find it so enjoyable. Uh, and it is fairly wide as a sound staging headphone, but it's not, it doesn't compete with the widest of them. Now, because of the characteristics of the imaging and the sound stage, what you will notice a lot with this headphone is recording quality. And uh, on good recording songs like that Diana Krall, uh, Popsicle Toes, that song has just layers and layers and layers to it. And it's got, you know, positions on the left, positions in the middle, positions on the right, and they're all very distinct. But when you listen to something that's maybe perhaps a little bit uh, mastered too far or, uh, you know, not very dynamic or not recorded well, you start to really compress that sound staging capability and the sounds can often come across two dimensional. So it's really gonna reveal the quality of your music. Now, if I were to compare it to the HD 800, the HD 800 kind of forces everything to sound like an HD 800. So it can kind of almost trick you into thinking that a recording is better than it is because the headphone forces it to sound uh, more three dimensional because of its soundstage capability. So depending on what you like there, that may be a consideration. Uh, so my conclusion of this headphone, if you're going to measure it for a technical performance, uh, something like the LCDX, I think would beat it. It's going to have a little bit beefier bass. It's going to have a little bit crisper and cleaner treble. It's going to have a little bit more forward overall sounds, and it's going to sound more immediate and fast. And for those types of things, uh, the LCDX, which is going to be my number two spot in the hall of fame down below. This takes number one because for me, and that's the important part for me, it is the right concoction of features. It really has the, you know, it really has the best of everything that I really like. It's got great warm bass response, but it's not too forward and it's not too much. It's got these great large lifelike vocals that come at you in a very unique way. I love that. The treble response is just about perfect for not only volume, but also placement. I like, I like treble, but I don't like to feel like I, it's being blasted or forced in my ear. And this really just is, again, for me, just a good conglomeration of all the different features. But to finish this off, there's a big caveat of this is the best so far. I'm always trying new headphones. I'm always trying things that are better than other things that I thought were really, really good. And that is really just how the evolution of this hobby goes. You try new things, things get better. Um, I have the Meze Imperium coming, and I'm not sure exactly when that will be here, but it will be here soon-ish. And uh, that's supposed to be an amazing headphone, and that might end up taking the category. But uh, this, so far, takes the number one spot by a pretty big margin. All right, now one last thing about the cost of this device. It is $1,600. That is definitely not cheap. Do you need to spend that much to get amazing sound? No, you really don't. The HE1000 before, which is a very similar headphone to this in terms of sound, I really did love that headphone, but it was so pricey that it was almost impossible for me to justify. And honestly speaking, everybody has their own budget, but with my income, there's no way I could you know, reasonably justify spending that much money on a headphone. Now, this much money, if I really wanted this thing, um, I could actually see myself spending the money on. So, you know, from a purchasing perspective, I can, this is gonna go person to person, but I can actually legitimately see myself buying one of these down the road. Uh, you know, although it, it would have to definitely be a, uh, a headphone that I, I really made sure that nothing else was gonna compete or beat. So for that, I really wanna try the Ananda and the Edition X and the Edition XX uh, to compare and see what those things are like. Yeah, I think that's gonna wrap it up, guys. Thank you very much for watching. I'll catch you in the next video. My name's Josh, signing off. Uh, when we moved down to Washington, there was a bunch of stuff that people didn't tell us about, like the fact that in the spring and fall, there are a ton of spiders, just like a ton of them. And uh, there was a spider on the chair and uh, I went to go get something to kill it with because I don't have any shoes on right now. And uh, when I got back, it was gone. So <laughs> I'm gonna do this whole review of the spider somewhere on this chair. Extraordinary price tag. And this still comes into that extraordinary price tag territory. So noisy. <laughs> so noisy at all times, always. <laughs> Hope you guys like street cleaners. <laughs>